All right, open with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11 this morning. And we're going to take this first section here in chapter 11, dealing with the raising of Lazarus from the dead. John 11, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 16 here this morning. Now this story that we're about to study takes place very near to the end of Christ's life and his ministry here on earth. In the previous chapter, we saw the time note. It said that it was the Feast of Dedication, which was somewhere in December. And in chapter 12, it says six days before the Passover. So the Passover was in April. So somewhere between December and April, chapter 11 takes place. So anywhere a few months to a few weeks before the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Now, is that a coincidence? I don't think so. I think that this whole occurrence of raising Lazarus from the dead is a divine work, a divine appointment, a divine work of God that he brought about just before his own death and resurrection. Why? Why is that important? Because it's probably the most powerful object lesson that the disciples could have had and that any of the people that saw this whole occurrence take place could have had. Because The resurrection of a man who is obviously dead, has been in his tomb for at least four days. Uh, In the old King James, it said that when Jesus wanted the tomb opened, you know, one of, uh, I think it was Mary or Martha said to Jesus, oh, don't open it, there is a stench. Well, in the old King James, it says, he stinketh. And that means this guy was for sure dead. There was no question. To raise him to life at that point would mean, wow, this is dramatic. So there are many lessons in this particular chapter that we're going to hit. I want to deal with just one this morning. And that is, why does God delay? Because Jesus delays in coming to Lazarus. Why did he do that? There is a reason for it. And we want to look at that reason. Because it's the same reason why God many times does not answer your prayer in your time. In your time frame. So let's just read the story. Verse 1 of chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany. Bethany was two miles east of of Jerusalem. So he was of this town, Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It is that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So John gives us just a little insight because there are so many Marys in the scripture. He wants us to make sure we know which Mary he's talking about. In chapter 12 of John, we're going to come to this place where she anoints him with this fragrant oil. And so John just gives us a little personal note there. And then it says in verse 3, Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, or permanent death. Because at this moment, he was already dead, as I'll explain in a moment. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. After this, he said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? 
Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? Yes. Is anyone, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So in other words, Jesus is declaring here, I understand exactly what I'm doing. I know and I've got it in hand. He uses this terminology here, the day and the night, as a a simple metaphor to explain one who walks in the truth and the knowledge of God and one who does not walk in the truth and the knowledge of God. One will not stumble, the other will stumble. Verse 11, these things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, which is a revelation of the um, omniscience of God, because only Jesus could have known that he was already dead. Verse 15, he said, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. And so here, the doubting Thomas here shows tremendous courage in declaring he is ready to die for his master. So why does Jesus wait? That is the obvious, clear indication in this text. There's no question he waited. He waited for what reason? That's the question you need to answer. And when you answer this question, you will come to the answer of why the Lord delays in your life. Why he delays in others' lives. Why does he do that? There is a very specific reason. In this text, just these first few verses, Jesus makes it very clear why he's doing what he is doing. So I want to give you five reasons why Jesus delayed, why God delays in answering your prayers sometimes and not answering as we think he should. The first is that God delays because he has his own plan and his own timing. Now, obviously, we know the rest of the story here. We know that Jesus intended to raise this man from the dead. But they did not have that understanding. We do have that understanding. So that, that gives us that overall picture, and we say, oh, okay, I can see why he would wait, because this was his plan. He didn't want to just heal this man. He wanted to raise him from the dead from such a state of being dead four days in the tomb that it would be absolutely clear that this guy just didn't, well, he just didn't go into a coma and then Jesus woke him up and he got better. The fever broke and he's okay now. No, Jesus wanted to make it absolutely clear. This guy's dead and I raised him to life again. So God has his own plan. Now, the problem with this is that we all have our own reasoning. We, we try and reason through, well, if you would have just done this or if you have just done that. If you turn over to verse 37, notice, what did they say to Jesus when he walks up to them? It says in verse 37, some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And the answer to that is yes. He could have kept him from dying. But that was not his intention. That was not his purpose. That was not his plan. And so God has a plan and I have a plan. 
And the two, many times, are not the same. I have a timing when I want it done. I want it done now. And he has a timing of when he will do what he plans. And it's many times not the same. This is where we struggle. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 makes this clear. There Solomon says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Lean not on your own understanding. Is that not what we do? We, Everyone in this room have second-guessed the Lord, told Him how He should do His job because we are leaning on our own understanding. Of course, he can do whatever he chooses to do. That is not the question. But is that his plan? And is that his timing? That's the question. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, there the Lord says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and that's pretty high, And so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So the way I think and the way he thinks are two different things. The way I think it should be done and the way he thinks it should be done are two different things. That's what scripture declares. So have you surrendered that which you may be struggling with right now? Something that's going on in your life. Somebody that you're praying for. And you say, Lord, why don't you just nail them? Why don't you just get them? Why don't you just change their mind? Why don't you just heal them right now? Why don't you just... And you can add whatever you want in there. Will you surrender your thoughts, your thinking, your way to Him? If you cannot do that, you will greatly struggle. And that is why Mary and Martha and all those that were around them struggled. They didn't and they couldn't do that. So this issue is a serious one. So why did God wait with Abraham and Sarah? You remember the story. God promised Abraham and Sarah a child and then they waited for 25 years. That's... Quite a wait, wouldn't you say? I mean, would would you have just given up after 25 years? I hope not. You, You just might have said yes, but I hope you wouldn't. I've been praying for some people in my family for as long as I've been a Christian. And I am not going to give up. I'm not. Because God has his own way, his own work, and I am not yielding. I'm not. Now, my mom came to live with us before she died here about a little more than a year ago. And when she moved in with us, we got to hear so many of the stories of how the Lord was answering my prayers for years and years. And I realized, you know, I I walked into her house one day and here's a Here's a gospel track laying on her table of her, of her in her kitchen. And I go, Mom, where'd you get this? She said, oh, somebody gave it to me. I go, oh, interesting. Good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for answering that prayer. Then I got to meet some of her friends and down, that lived down the street. Great Christian folks. I said, how, how, how long do you know them, Mom? Oh, a long time. They're just great people. Nice folks. And then next door to her moves in a pastor. <laughs> and I go, Lord, you're too good. Thank you. Another answer prayer. You see, you know, the Lord answers our prayer whether I can see it or whether I know it or not. And You've got to believe that he is doing his work. 
Now, Abraham and Sarah struggled with this. And they struggled for years and years. We'll get a little more as to why they struggled in a minute. But basically, it was a timing issue. God had a specific time that he wanted to bring this child forth. And it, he wasn't coming it, not one day early. It says in Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? He asks them. At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Genesis 21 2. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. So there was a plan. And there was a timing. And again, those are two separate things. You, you have to see that as separate. God's plan and God's timing to work that plan out. So we all have things that we ask God for that have not happened. Is it his timing? Is it his plan? Which is the case? You see, we aren't always going to be able to figure it out. That's the bottom line. I know we try. I've tried many times. You're not going to do it. My ways are not his ways. The way he thinks is not the way I think. And that is the bottom line. So will you rest there? Will you surrender it there? You see, he has a plan. And it's a good plan. In Jeremiah 29, 11. There the Lord says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. He knows exactly what he's thinking. He knows exactly what he's doing. And it's a good thing. And it's to give you a future and a hope. He has a plan and he's working that plan. The second thing that a reason why God delays is to test and to strengthen your faith. Oh, how I hate this one. I don't like it. And you don't like it. But it is absolutely essential. You see, a test of your faith is going to cause you to grow in your faith. Now, Jesus makes it very clear that that is what he is trying to do here. He is trying to get them to trust him. Now we'll see that even more in our next study. Because he, he very specifically says, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. He's trying to encourage them. But he states it here in our text very clearly. Verse 15. He says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. That you may believe. But you see, when their brother died... And Jesus didn't show up. I guarantee you, I'll bet you that they struggled. They struggled with that. Wouldn't you have? The master, why didn't he come? Why didn't he stop this? Why didn't he just heal him? I mean, Jesus healed the centurion's servant from afar. He just said, it's done, go. He's healed. He doesn't even have to be there to heal him. So this was a struggle for them very definitely in their hearts and in their lives. But this was the issue with Sarah and Abraham. The scripture tells us very clearly that this was the struggle that, and the reason why God waited for so long. He was trying to deal with their faith. Now, if you were a hundred years old and the Lord said to you, you're going to have a child, you'd probably say, okay, um... Maybe if there's a miracle, and that was the point. He wanted them to trust him for a miracle, you see. To trust him to do something that was beyond what they could even fathom. Because he wanted them to trust him for all the rest that he had promised them. That he would make them a blessing to all the world through their seed. You see, that's even a bigger miracle, is it not? And yet every one of us here that believes in Jesus today is the fulfillment of that promise because God fulfills his promises. 
So it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 18 and 21. Here Paul tells us the reason why they had to wait. He said, who contrary to hope believed in hope. You see, contrary to everything that Abraham thought or felt, he had to believe in something that was beyond himself. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. See, there's the word. There's the promise. So he had to hope in God's promise alone. Verse 21 of Romans 4. He says, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Now, the word convinced there means persuaded. He was fully persuaded, fully convinced. Now, was that immediate? No. It was over this 25-year period of time, God persuaded him and convinced him. And that's what he's doing in every one of our lives as well. Now, God allows trials. He allows these needs to come in front of us so that we would, our, our faith would be tested. This is what he did with Philip in John 6, verses 5 and 6. Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he knew himself what he would do. So Jesus doesn't ask questions because he doesn't know what he's going to do. He asks questions so that he might test the faith of those whom he asks. And that's what he did here with Philip. What was he trying to do with Philip? I, we don't know. There's not a full answer. Yes, Philip was near to where his hometown would, was. Would he depend on the people in his village to come up with all the bread? We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But he asked Philip specifically. So there was a specific test for him. As God will deal in your life specifically for issues that you're struggling with. It's all a test. Will you trust him? Now remember, when God delays, it's not always a denial. It's just a delay. Did he want to fulfill this raising of Lazarus? Absolutely. So his delay was not a denial. Now, sometimes we want God to delay. You say, well, when do you want God to delay? Well, let me give you an example. In Isaiah 30, verse 18. There it says, Therefore the Lord will wait, that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice, Blessed are all those who wait for him. So he says, therefore the Lord will wait that he might be gracious to you. Well, what is he talking about here? Well, if you read the context, he's talking about judgment. He's saying, judgment is coming on this land. But he says, I'm going to wait. I'm just going to wait a space of time so that I might be gracious to you that I might show you my mercy. Now, every one of us in this room is very thankful that God waited to bring judgment on our world and our nation before we got saved, right? I am, I'm so glad he waited and allowed me to get saved. But are you concerned about those who are still not yet saved? I hope that you're praying for him. I hope that you're sharing your faith with people on a regular basis. And if you aren't, ask God for holy boldness so that you will share your faith. You need it. We all need it. And so God waits to show mercy. He is gracious in waiting. So many times we, we think, oh no, no, God, I want you to do it now. I want you to come and Deliver this world from the evil that is 
overtaking it. Well, he might just be saying, I'm going to wait just a little longer because there's a few more people I want to save. And I, I hope that we're praying in that respect. So, in the context, it's very clear, very clear. He's waiting to be gracious. Now, if you say, God, you're delaying, and I, think, I don't think you really want to do it. If you come to that conclusion... You're going to do one of two things. You're going to walk away in anger and unbelief. Or you're going to trust him and say, God, I don't understand what you're doing. Now, I have said that to the Lord many times. I will probably say it many more times. Because he does things that I don't understand. Why? Because my thoughts are not his thoughts. My ways are not his ways. And I am not going to always understand it. So that's the key. Which will you do? Will you trust him? Because that's the test. Now, if you don't trust him and you get angry and you get resentful and you walk away and you say, forget this. I don't even know whether I believe God even exists. I don't even know whether I even believe God wants to give me anything. Then I can guarantee you it will be a denial you will experience denial because you're not going to receive anything. That's what James tells us in James 1, verses 6 and 7. We're to ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. So my faith, the test of my faith, is really an important thing. It is a good thing. And it causes me to grow and mature through that time of testing. So if you count his delays as a denial, then I guarantee you, you will stumble in your faith. Do not think that way. God's delays is not automatically a denial. But if you, if you don't trust him, it does become an automatic denial for sure now the third reason why God delays is to magnify his glory notice verse 4 he says it clearly this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the son of God may be glorified through it through it you see you have to go through circumstances for God to glorify himself in those circumstances. So this is the the point. Here in this story with Lazarus, which would bring more glory to God? To heal Lazarus or to raise him from the dead after four days in the tomb? The answer is obvious. The more glory would obviously be from raising him from the dead. So think about that. You see, God has his glory that he is concerned about. Why is that? Well, because it's not about my glory. It's not about my will. It's not about my plan. It's about his plan, his glory, what he's doing. And again, the two are not always the same. I have a plan, but his plan is what's going to actually bring the greatest glory to himself. Now you say, well, why does he need glory? Well, what is glory? Think about it for a minute. What is the glory of God? How does the raising of Lazarus bring glory to God? Because it focuses people on who he is. It focuses them on his power, on his love, his concern, his authority, his honor. Now, isn't that what people need to see in this world today? They don't need to see me. They need to see him. They need to see who he is and who Jesus is. That's who they need to see. And that is why God works all things out that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Always. 
He is glorified in touching people, raising them from the dead. And he is glorified in his judgment upon this land as well. In Ezekiel 38, verse 23, there the Lord says, after he speaks about this great judgment that is going to come upon Russia and many of the Middle Eastern countries that are going to come with them, which we can see actually they're, they're taking their spots. They're taking their position right now. Do you know that Russia is in Syria right now? They're just across the border. The Syrians have allowed Hezbollah to come from Lebanon to along the northern coast of, or northern uh, boundary of Israel along the Golan Heights now. And so they're, they're basically surrounding them. It's all being set up. It's all being fulfilled. But there in Ezekiel 38, he says, after he judges them them when they come against Israel, he says, thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. How? Through judgment. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And after Jesus finished the raising of Lazarus from the dead, They knew he was the Lord. There was no question in their mind. So a powerful experience. Now this is why God does whatever he does. Is to bring a person to the recognition of his own glory. Then that they might trust in him. In John 2, 11. Remember the the first miracle that Jesus did. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples did what? They believed in him. So this is the point. This is, do you see the connection here? When he manifests his glory, we're going to believe. We're going to believe because we're going to see he's the one that did it. It's not man that has done it. It's God that has done it. Now the fourth reason why God delays is sometimes he does not answer because it is not his will. Now this is another reason that is essential to understand. Again, my ways are not his ways. And so sometimes I'm praying for things that are just plain not his will. Now this is Best scene, I think, and one of the best examples of this is with Paul's thorn in the flesh. You remember Paul had some kind of physical ailment. And he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, I probably would have pleaded with the Lord 50 times, but he pleaded three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, God said no. So there is an answer that comes from the Lord that is yes. There's an answer that comes from the Lord that says wait, not now. And there is a no that also comes from the Lord. I think that this is an essential to understand because not everything that I ask for is according to his will. Now people say, well, Steve, wait a minute. Jesus said, anything you ask in my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Yes, Jesus said that. But He assumes that you would not ask something that is not according to his will. Do you see? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is why John teaches us to pray in 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, there's that word anything again, anything according to his will, He hears us. And John goes on to say, if he hears us, then we have the petitions we have desired of him. So, 
Obviously, there are things that are just plain not his will. But there's one more thing. There's one more issue. As when you pray for someone else, not praying for yourself, you're praying for someone else, now you have another issue that comes into play. And that is their will. See, God has a will, they have a will, and I have a will. So, who's, who's going to win in that circumstance? It's going to be God. One of the best examples of this is 1 Corinthians 16, 12. It says there, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. So, are you praying for someone that doesn't know the Lord and wondering how come the heavens don't open up upon them and they just see and realize what's, what's happening in their life? Well, they have a will. As I shared with you before, concerning my own mother, praying for her, seeing all of those ways that the Lord was answering my prayer all those years, God is doing the same. He is speaking to them at this moment. The moment you confess their name, He is praying for them. He is touching them. He's speaking to them. He is convicting them. He's opening their eyes. And at that moment, they have a will. And they have to make that decision. Will they respond or will they not? So how long was it before you responded? How long was it before you yielded? And you knew God was speaking to you. You knew God was sending people into your life. How long was it? Well, for me, it was a while. And for some of you, it may have been years. That is the same work that God is doing as you pray for them. Now think about this in reference to to your children. Do you give to your children every single thing that they ask for and when they ask for it? You just hop to. You just jump right up and you go get it. And you do it. No. Nobody does that. Except maybe for grandparents. (laughs) But that's, that's that's not reality. You know, you don't do that. You don't respond that way. Because it's not, sometimes you say to yourself, I'm not going to get that toy for them. I mean, they are not old enough to handle this thing. If I put them behind the, the wheel of this thing, I mean, they'd kill themselves. You know, if I did allow this or that, or they just don't have the maturity to handle this freedom at this moment. Obviously, you would not do it. And so, this is the same thing with the Lord. He doesn't respond. He says, no. Or, wait. Or, yes and amen. One of, the, one of the three, he will respond. Now, the fifth and last reason why God delays is that his delay has nothing to do with whether or not he loves you. Now, why do I bring this up? Because it's really clear in this text that, notice verses 5 and 6. John says, Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus. So then he heard that he was sick. He stayed two more days in the place where he was. You say to yourself, wow. I mean, that's, you know, why would he bring this up? Why would he state this, that he loved them? Because he, John wanted to make it absolutely clear it wasn't an issue of love. It was an issue of God's plan and his timing. He had another plan, and he was going to fulfill it. It was not a question of love. Now, that question and that lie that God doesn't love you 
He doesn't love them. Don't, don't buy that lie. It is one of the most fundamental ways that Satan divides people and, and separates them from the Lord. They don't love you. God doesn't love you. Don't believe that lie. Now, if God is not love, then God does not exist. But he is love, and he does exist. And if somebody else doesn't love you, then they aren't walking right with the Lord. Same, same issue. So this issue, don't believe this lie. Because if you believe it, it will, it will separate you. You will get angry. You will get upset with God. And this is not what he desires. I believe that God wants to give to you more than you even want to receive it. That is the God that we serve. And he loves you more than you can even comprehend. It says in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's his good pleasure to give you everything that you have need of. If you don't have something, then you don't need it at this moment. And you say to yourself, well, yes, I do. Your ways are not his ways. Okay, Your thoughts are not his thoughts. That's the problem. That's where you haven't yielded. And so he loves you and he wants to give to you. Are you willing and ready to receive it? That's the question. Will you just receive it? Receive it by faith. But if you believe the lie, if you allow that lie to be formed in your head, God doesn't love you, you will fall to the the very first sin that took Adam and Eve out. Genesis 3, verse 5. Satan said to them, God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he's telling her, God's trying to keep something back from you because he doesn't want you to really have everything that you should have. You see, he knows good and evil. He doesn't really want you to know good and evil. Now, Are any of you the worse off in your life because you know what evil is? Plenty worse off. Okay, I could do really well with just only knowing what good is. That would be the best life, would it not? Think of a world where all we knew was what was good and not what was evil. Oh, it would be a totally different world. You would be a totally different person. But she believed the lie and she disobeyed God. And that is the temptation that every everyone has to deal with. Now, one of my favorite authors, Warren Worsby, he said this. He said, God's love is not a pampering love, but a perfecting love. A perfecting love does not shelter you from all pain and the difficulties in life. God's love didn't even protect his own son from the pain and sorrow and shame of the cross. Think of it. I mean, those are some very powerful words of truth. I mean, which do you believe? Do you, is your God a God who has pampering love or perfecting love? You see, again, as parents, do you just pamper and give them everything they want? Or do you want to perfect them? Which requires you sometimes to say, wait. Or other times to say, no. This is not good for you. And so, which are you? I think that's an important thing. If you're raising kids, you have to ask yourself that question. Which do you do? Are you one who pampers or one who wants to perfect? He loves you 
And he always wants your best for you. He wants to give you the best if you will receive it, if you'll wait for him. Now, when you are in the midst of one of those times of trial, and you're maybe even questioning whether or not he does love you, the bigger question will be, will you choose to love him as you wait, as he delays? Are you willing to to love him and trust him to fulfill his plan? You see, that's really the issue. Again, it's not that God loved me. Okay? That's that's not the issue. It's how will he love me? That is the issue. When and how will he bring that love about in my life? You see, the question is, will you love him and respond? Will you trust him in the midst of that? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we just come to you, Lord, looking and believing you to do that work inside of each of us, Lord. Lord, for those here this morning that are struggling with your timing and your plan, Lord, that are being severely tested, Lord, I pray that you would give your strength and your grace. Lord, just open their hearts, open their eyes, Lord, to see that you have another plan. Lord, just fill with faith at this moment. Fill with faith to just rest their soul. Will you just cry out to him? Just say, Lord, perfect my faith. Don't pamper me, perfect my faith. Change me so that I will follow you, surrender to you, and accept that you have another plan that I don't quite understand. Lord, I pray that you would give us that understanding. Open our eyes, open our hearts. Lord, that we can see what you want to do. Lord, keep us from that blindness that is only focused on what we want. Lord, help us to cry out, your kingdom come, your will be done. Help us, Lord, to see beyond our own will, our own desires, and see yours. Lord, we turn our hearts towards you this morning. Help us to learn this lesson. You taught it to Mary and Martha. Lord, help us to learn it. We believe you to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.